Ba -ba 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 -da -da -ba 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 Hello everyone, this is Rabbi Kenneth Hahn for JUTV. It's Ask the Rabbi Thursdays, and I'm broadcasting very late today because um, I'm not just a rabbi, I'm a proud father. And um, today was my son's college graduation, and he actually graduated from Harvard today, so that's very exciting for all of us. And um, I'm broadcasting... To, because uh, the commencement speaker today was Mark Zuckerberg, and of course I have been talking about technology lately, and it just seemed appropriate to do something quick insofar as Mark Zuckerberg was the commencement speaker today at Harvard. So I want to say a little bit more about technology. I've talked in the past about kind of the diagnostic role Judaism has played in looking at our relationship to technology and where it can go wrong. I want to say a little bit more about that and, and a few things that we might do to make it right. <clears throat> so again, to remind you, why is it that the Jewish wisdom tradition in the first place would have anything relevant to say about um, how I use my iPhone or why, um, what, what we, how we might relate to nuclear technology whatever aspect of technology we're talking about. And the reason why I argue that it is very relevant is that Judaism, among the world's religions today that have survived anyway, is probably the one that has spent the most time uh, dealing with agriculture. Most Jewish holidays are actually agricultural holidays, and of course we talk a lot about how we relate to agriculture in Judaism. And um, what I realized is agriculture was just the first widespread use of technology, or one of the first widespread uses of technology. And, um, and insofar as Judaism looks at our relationship to agriculture, we can use that as a placeholder, it turns out, for any technology and extrapolate from there. So, um, and when I think about technology, to be clear, I'm talking about the application of scientific knowledge to accomplish something, to address an issue or a problem, and in particular, to in some way or another control or manipulate the environment around us, whether it's the environment that we think of as the environment or just any small environment we're in. Um, could be a car or whatever, it, but we want to control our environment. So um, what, what I'll do is just review very quickly a few of the insights I think we can discern from the Jewish wisdom tradition, and these come straight from the Torah as it happens. So the first one I want to talk about, and there are a great many, is um, Judaism really defines, I think, the optimal stance we should take towards how we relate to an environment or the environment. Uh, and what we learn in our, one of our two creation myths, and I'm thinking now of the Garden of Eden, is that the, the optimal stance is really one of stewardship, where we acknowledge that we are part, a part of the environment and don't have dominion over it, and that our best, our best approach is really to be a steward rather than the master of the environment. And that's very clear. It's a very clear message in the story of Adam and Eve, but of course we know what happened. Um, we ate from the tree of knowledge, acquired knowledge and self-awareness, and started using that knowledge to manipulate our environment. <clears throat> and uh, in that respect, the cat was out of the bag, and uh, we let the cat out of the bag. And that's really kind of how it works with, with just about every technology. We embrace it, and um, frequently not knowing what the consequences of embracing it will be, and, um, and then we deal with the consequences, good or bad, of that technology. So, um, and to be clear, technology is not inherently deemed something good or bad in Judaism. After all, in the next story, the story of the flood, we use technology to save humanity. But by the same token, in the very end of that story, we use technology to build a tower up to the sky, the Tower of Babel, because we have, in our, rec in our recognition that we have learned how to manipulate environments and control outcomes to some degree, we start not just to think that we are in the Jewish 
parlance, B'Tselem Elohim, or created in the image of God, we start to think that we actually are God ourselves. We take on this God mindset, and um, it's very significant in the context of agriculture because, of course, agriculture addressed one of the very basic existential questions of humanity, namely, where is my next meal coming from? Um, in that context, we, we um, so the first one we had was uh, the optimal stance in towards an environment when we're in it, and then we know that we developed a God mindset in association with technology. Um, the next one I would say, fast forwarding in the Torah, is when we embrace technological means and methods, very frequently we screw things up. And that, uh, the, the best example of that, and the, the, the ultimate example of that in the Torah, and really the defining uh, story many people feel for the Jewish people, is the story of the Exodus. In Egypt, as presented in the Torah, and as it was actually in existence at the time, was really the ultimate expression of a, an agricultural, and hence a technological society. And Egypt was characterized by, of course, autocratic rule, a pharaoh, gross disparities in wealth and income, um, an immiserated underclass, um, um, highly centralized planning and control, and, um, and of course an army, because not everybody had to be involved in food production since it was a technologically produced food. And so that left uh, excess labor, and that labor could be used to man an army. And Egypt had an army, and that army could be used to defeat other cultures or to suppress the domestic population when necessary. And if all that sounds all too familiar with our own current situation, well, it should, because we are, like Egypt, a very highly technological society. Um, so what in particular does Judaism suggest we can do to address these things? One thing that's very clearly delineated in the Torah is the concept of Shemitah, or the uh, sabbatical year. And the sabbatical year is very important for two reasons, I would argue. The first is, we literally, in the sabbatical year, the idea is we give the land a rest, and every seventh year, we don't plant. And that's important because, number one, we are um, allowing the land to rest. Um, in the greater scheme of things, we are um, giving a rest so that creativity can be possible, because of course if we do the same thing all the time, then there's no room for newness. Um, and by not planting, we can think about what we might want to plant when we start planting again, for example. Most importantly, perhaps, I think the, making the conscious choice not to plant means that we are throwing ourselves back into the state of grace in a certain sense that we were in when we occupied the Garden of Eden, where we relied upon God to provide and understood at a very visceral level that we couldn't control all outcome and we didn't necessarily know where our next meal was coming from, but that was okay because we knew that that one way or another, the universe would provide for us. Um, so it's a great sense of relief in a certain sense to let go of having to control every outcome. And of course, these days we try more and more to control every outcome. The final, the final thing I'll just mention in, in this talk is Shabbat. And Shabbat is frequently thought of as the greatest gift Judaism has given to humanity, and it really is an amazing gift. And now, particularly in the context of Mark Zuckerberg's remarks, I would say um, <clears throat> when I think about using my iPhone, um, the really dangerous aspect of it is how I can use it to make every day and every moment of every day very, very similar in terms of the quality of my interaction with it. And um, one of the things that has become problematic over time is the time has become homogenous. Every day is like every other day. Every hour can be... And in particular, um, we can work t today 
whenever, from wherever, for whatever reason. And I think this is why many companies are now moving to this new concept of employees being able to take as much vacation time as they want or need when they need it. Because there's a recognition on the part of those companies that their employees work all the time. They work at the office, they work while they're commuting, they work when they get home, when, after they've put the kids a bit, to bed, and sometimes, sadly, even before their children go to bed. And, you know, technology was supposed to free up time so that we would have more time for leisure or for um, creativity, which is the real goal of Shabbat as it happens. And one of the key principles of Judaism is creation. And um, it hasn't worked out that way. Um, I think for the most part we use our phones for to distract us from the discomfort of our our lives frequently and um, and we work all the time you know we can answer email all the time and so, and so what Judaism says is <clears throat> six days of the week we do one thing and on the seventh day we do it very differently um, one of our greatest modern sages, Abraham Joshua Heschel, referred to Shabbat as a cathedral in time, in that in general, in Judaism, we don't build big physical spaces, but we have built this very profound cathedral of time. And um, Shabbat is, n is about doing things, as I say, in a very different kind of way, and delineating a very different kind of relationship to time. And I think what Judaism suggests is that it's not enough to do it just a little bit here and there. You have to do it in a significant enough way that it actually changes your relationship to the whole endeavor, to the whole process. And, um, and I guess our, our great sages thought that 24 hours, 25 hours was really a good amount. Now, I'm not going to suggest that you become Shomer Shabbos, that you observe Shabbat very religiously, traditionally, and dil diligently, um, because you may already do it, or you may have no intention of doing it. But what I will suggest that you consider is ways in which you would set an intention for a seventh day, whether it's Saturday or some other day of the week, where you do things really differently and that you create a structure in your life that will support that. Um, so the intention of Shabbat is to change your relationship to time and being Shomer Shabbos is the traditional structure that's used to allow for that to happen. That may not work for you, that structure, um, in which case you might want to set a different kind of structure. But I think what Judaism suggests is that it should be a, sig a significant structure. And, um, and very importantly, whatever structure you create for yourself, you really need to follow religiously. And with that, I'll say for now, Lihitra uh, Ot, it's been great spending a few minutes with you. If you like this, uh, broadcast, please feel free to share it with your friends and tune in next Monday for Music Mondays and I'll see you, God willing, next Thursday. Bye-bye.